Ibn Rabbi Yonason retracted from his initial view. So Rabbi Yonason on 18a had mentioned that uh, he felt that the Mesim Enam Yoidim Uma, he brought a verse, the dead don't know anything. And then it says on 18b on the bottom, it says, even Rabbi Yonason retracted from that opinion and uh, he brings a proof um, because uh, Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmeni said in his name that the Mesim speak to each other and they knew about Maisha, uh, they knew about that Maisha went to them and and told them that they have Eretz Yisrael, that they're gonna, that uh, Hashem is giving Eretz Yisrael to the Yidden, and really they knew about it. So you know, so so really they they anyway knew, and so we see they know what's going on. In the world. So that was the conclusion of the Gemara. And then the Gemara said that when you person speaks negative about a mace, it's as if you spoke about a it's as if you spoke about a stone, meaning that there's no feelings, or they 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 simply either they they don't know that you spoke bad about them, or that they don't care it doesn't hurt them it's not painful to them and um and then the gemara asked a question but R- 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 papa said that someone spoke against mar shmuel and uh, something bad happened to him a a um a uh, a, a pole fell on his on his head and the the his the, the his membrane that surrounded the brain uh it it cracked and so we see that the dead obviously know what's going on and that's why this punishment happened to this person who spoke negatively about marshmallow and what is the gemara answer anyone know what the gemara answers The Gemara answers. No, he said, "No, Hashem is the one who protects the honor of the dead." No, the sky. Right. So, so what exactly? How does that answer the question? What did we think initially, and what did we? What was the answer that the Gemara changed our view? What? How did we initially understand this? Why was it a question? What did we think? Because so, the dead, because the dead are are dead, they they have no feeling to with respect to this, and from what this is basically saying is that that is true. However, Hashem is the one who protects the honor of the dead. So initially, we Rav Papa's statement implied that the dead feel. The dead know what's going on and the dead have feelings. And how do we see that from the fact that the person got hurt? So it seems like the fact that the person, Hashem punished the person, was because Marshmuel is in pain and Hashem is taking, uh, giving a punishment because you caused pain to Marshmuel. The Gemara's answer is no, it's not that Mar Shmuel re- had pain. It's that you did something that's inappropriate, that's, embar- that's, that's dishonoring, that's disrespectful to Mar Shmuel, whether he felt it or not. You did something that's disrespectful. So the Gemara initially understood that it's only a punishment if you actually cause pain. And the Gemara's conclusion is even if he doesn't, it, he doesn't know or he doesn't... Uh, he doesn't have feel it, feel the pain, but it's still disrespectful, and therefore the punishment is for the disrespect, even though Marshmallow is not feeling the pain or doesn't hurt him. So that would seem to be the the back and forth of the Gemara, the question and the answer of the Gemara. Okay, so then the next Gemara, I think maybe we'll start. Let's let's begin here. We're on the first word on the line, Amar, but I see Robert has a question. Yes, Robert. I mean, to defeat, but. Um, and I hope it's not a contradiction. I misunderstood. One of the things when we had discussion with Rabbi Pinson was is that eventually 
um, when the brain is absorbed more by the neshama and it rises up to the gan Eden, we don't the brain the, the the dead person does not feel does not have any contact eventually with the contemporary world, and so um, so if somebody else can help me with this, but that was my understanding of that that eventually um, it leaves the sort of the earthly and becomes part of the heavenly to then work to then be a part of again the um, reunion with those that who passed on before him to then have that time with them within the time of what was their relationship when they were alive. That's the best way I think I can interpret what Rabbi Pinson said. Mm -hmm. um, Ezra, do you remember any of that or Ben? Yeah, I, I remember that. I, I think what he said is after a certain period of time, like after one year, I think is when the complete disconnect yeah. Uh, from what yeah. I remember, if you remember the same discussion you and I had, is that after 50 years, the the soul is no longer involved with with what occurs here on Earth. So. Um, but even in, in that, I mean, with respect to what was being said over here, uh, the feeling is that uh, he Go to another may not, uh, I'm sorry, feel, he may or not feel what is happening in the world. He may or may not feel the pain, but in either case, Hashem protects his honor. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, okay, within the broader context. Right. I mean, I'm not sure. If, if, if that's what Rabbi Pinson said, I think he might have said that he doesn't feel his body. He's not doesn't feel connected to that body anymore. Yes. And and if so, then it, it doesn't really have something to do with what we're talking about is is the per, is someone making fun of him. And so, you know, it's, I, I don't know if that would necessarily be an issue about the 50 year limit or not in other words it's still uh dishonor and it still could cause pain to the soul um that someone is embarrassing him in other words saying something negative about him because it was a, a combination of the body and the soul that they're making fun of so uh, it would seem that that might be um you know it could still bother the person um because it, you know, even if it's not, he's not so connected to the body. It's still, his soul that the, that they were making fun of, it, it, you know, because it's the body with the soul that made choices. So possibly, you know, that would be um, possibly that would be an issue. I, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, it doesn't say that this was after 50 years, so it doesn't. It, it's not a problem. To, you know, I could be wrong, and it doesn't. It's not a question on the the, the, the Gemara would not be a, a question. I'm just. You know, I, I, I don't know if it's really connected to here. That's all I'm, I'm mentioning. Yeah, it's no, possible. That's, that's I, I didn't mean to imply that the, that the 50 years comes into play. All I'm saying is that Hashem uh, looks out for the honor of scholars, irrespective of what, you know, right. if where they feel it, it. when it is. Irrespective so of if they feel it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's good. Okay, yeah. I'm Rabbi Ben Levi. So Rabbi Shor Ben Levi says, so we're now... Uh, 10 lines down from the top of the page. And Rabbi Shoban Levi said, whoever speaks after the bed of, of, the, of, of the scholars, which means after their, their passing, that's the term used as after their, their uh, coffin, like that, uh, which means after they pass, if you speak negative about them, Neufel Begehenim falls into hell. So speaking bad about them, um, about a Tamil Chacham, will be punished and will go, will go to Gehenim. So again, the first Gemara that we learned um, a few lines earlier said that it's as if, if you speak negative about someone who passed away, it's as if you spoke about a stone meaning that he doesn't know or 
that he's not going to feel the pain. Then we had Rav Papa saying that someone gets punished. They speak about a, a, a Talmud Chacham. It gave, gave, an, it gave a, uh, a story where uh, someone spoke bad about Marshmuel and um, and uh, and uh, this uh, pole fell on him. And so we see that Hashem demands respect for the scholars. And here, Rabbi Yishob ben Levi says, that the person will go to Gehenim if if they, you know, if they speak negative about a Talmud Chacham about a scholar. Shenem, as it says, v'hamatim akal kolaisam. It says initially the the verse states Hashem does good for the for good people, the righteous people, meaning the scholars, and v'hamatim and those that turn to their crookedness, in other words, those that speak about their crookedness, Yelicham Hashem as Oven, Hashem will um, will take them together with the doers of evil to hell. Shalom al Yisrael, peace on Israel. And what that means is even Bashash Shalom al Yisrael, even what the, the last three words, what do the last three words mean? Even at a time when there is peace on Israel, meaning when the when the the, the scholar passed away, Yelicham Hashem as Pauli Ha'aben, Hashem will uh, will take them to Gehenna. Hashem will take the person with the with the doers of evil to hell. So meaning even after the person passed away, and there's Shalom Yisrael, which means after the death, and um, um, which means that maybe it doesn't bother the, 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 the deceased, but nevertheless, um, in other words, he's at peace. So similar to the previous Gemara that uh, uh, it doesn't bother him. So even at such a time um, that there's Shalom Yisrael, it's nevertheless, is, uh, Hashem is going to punish the, the doer of uh, uh, the, 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 the person who says these negative things and, and he's going to go to Gehenna. Tana Dvei Rabbi Yishmael. In the base Medrash of Rabbi Yishmael, a Tana learned. Im, or, or, or the base Medrash of, of Rabbi Yishmael, they learned. Im Ra'isa Tamad Chacham, if you saw a scholar Sha'avar Avira Balaila that sinned, did a sin at night. Al Tahir Acharov, do not have any thoughts, negative thoughts about him by Yoim during the day. In other words, don't think that he's he did an Avera at night, don't think that he is still a Russia. That he is still, he, his Avera is still with him. Shema also Chuba. Because maybe he did Chuba. The Gemara asks, Shema, Salka do you think maybe he did Chuba? So the Gemara says, Elavadai also Chuba. For sure he did Chuba. So if a scholar did something wrong at night, you should assume the next day that he did Chuba. And um, you shouldn't have any thoughts that he, you know, doesn't regret what he did. And this applies to things that are connected to himself. Aval bimamayna, but connected to his money, to, to, to monetary matters. Ad lamare, until he returns it to the owner, it's not a real tshuva. The real tshuva is only after he returns it. So things that are between him and Hashem, we have to assume that he did tshuva. Uh, if it's something between him and someone else, then, you know, 
we assume after you know we, we assume if he you know obviously if he returned it we assume we, we know he did shuva but uh, until then we don't know because it's not a real repentance unless he returns what he, <coughs> he took now obviously we're not talking about a crook here that stole from someone because then he wouldn't be called a Talmud Chacham a scholar what we're talking about is someone who didn't follow the beyond the letter of the law that's expected of a scholar. And there's a certain level of expectation that we, we, we hold the scholar to a higher, um, uh, to, you know, to a higher or wrong standard. Higher standard, thank you. A higher standard. And therefore, uh, if, he, if he didn't, um, uh, if he didn't, he, he, he would need to return this whatever monetary issue it is on his standard. But of course, we're not talking about outright stealing because then he would not be called a scholar. Yes, uh, Robert, you have a question? You're, you're muted. I do, I do. No, thank you. Um, part of what, as I read and absorb more of you know, what we talk about, there seems to be the righteous man and the wicked man. It's, so the righteous is a pious man or a, or a Talmud Chacham, and the wicked man is an evil individual. So I guess the question is, how, where do we fit in on all of that? Are we, as long as we don't do anything wicked or evil, what are we regarded as? Are we righteous as well? Because we, you know, we live our life as best we can as a Jew. And so I just wonder, you know, I don't think there's any areas of gray in the process, but I'd just like to get a sense of uh, how this comes together um, in sort of right. the, the constellation of life. So the Talmud often refers to the, uh, it has a number of terms in the, in the Gemara, in the Talmud. There's a, a term called chassid. Right. There's a ter, you know, there is such a term, there's a term called tzaddik. There's a term called uh, yirei alikim, ish yirei, you know, uh, yiras, uh, yiras There are different terms uh, that are used, and uh, you know, um, in our Gemara, it's using the term Talmud Chacham. Talmud Chacham is someone who's a scholar, but not what we think of a scholar, because we think of a scholar just as someone who belongs, who, you know, who could be give a good lecture. That's not exactly a scholar of the of the of the of the Talmud. A scholar of the Talmud is someone who's level of righteousness matches his scholarliness. Now, there could be someone who's a chassid who might be more righteous than a Talmud Chacham. Doesn't mean he's the highest level of righteousness because the term chassid in the Gemara would mean someone who's more pious than a Talmud Chacham. But it definitely means that he is someone who has a certain standard that's beyond the, that's higher than the regular individual. So weak would be considered bainanim. We are in the category of intermediaries. Now, when, a, when we sin, we fall into the Russia category. But then we do tshuva, we go back to the bainanim category. When the, when the Talmud Chacham sins, he also falls into the, um, the, the Russia category. And as we just learned that it's possible that he might sin. And when he comes back, he would also be in the Bainani category, but he's a Talmud Chacham, so he, is, he deserves respect. In other words, a Talmud Chacham is not necessarily a tzaddik. Uh, a, a tzaddik would be someone who never, you know, who doesn't sin. And therefore, um, and the reason why he doesn't sin is not because he's born that way, but he removed all the desires of sin all the urges of sin from his from his innards. So, in other words, the bainani is 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 basically who we're talking about here, and we're talking about a Talmud Chacham who sinned. Now, uh, uh, he 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 sinned, but we we're sure he did tshuva. So he sinned, um, and uh, and that would be you know he basically would be called a. A Benini, and when he sins, he falls into the category of Russia, but you sh can't call him a Russia because he probably did tshuva, the Gemara says. 
or not probably, for sure he did tshuva. So maybe for, we don't know when he did tshuva, but by the next morning he did tshuva. The next morning you have to assume he already did tshuva. Now that's one way of learning the Gemara. Another way of learning the Gemara is that possibly we're talking about a Talmud Chacham that's a tzaddik that when it says he did an Avera, it means he did not use his full an Avera like Moshe Rabbeinu did an Avera, like David HaMelech did an Avera, that he didn't use his full energy to serve Hashem. You know, that type of an Avera, that he, he didn't sin, he has no, but maybe he didn't serve Hashem on the highest level that is expected of him. And then we would be talking about a tzaddik. And in that case, we're talking about a tzaddik, so on his level, it's called a chet. It's called like a sin. And, and then the Gemara says, but, but uh, for sure he did tshuva because, uh, um, the, you know, there's no question, badai also tshuva, he definitely did tshuva. But um, the simple meaning of the Gemara is we're talking about a pain in it. A chacham does not mean a tzaddik. It just means someone who is a great scholar, who is on the same, in, and also on a high level of righteousness. But it doesn't mean that that he is, you know, he has removed all, all of, um, you know, uh, uh, the urge from within him that he could, he, he, you know, he could be able to sin. Okay, now we're going to continue. And the next Gemara is another statement of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. So the previous statement was Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. You spoke about, uh, he mentioned the law that, that, the, that if a person speaks negative about a Talmud Chacham after he passed away, he will go to Gehenna. And now Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says another statement. Well, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, we're, we're now a, a, the fifth wide line. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says, V'chaf dalad m'kaymais, Bezdin Menadin al Kavid Harav. In 24 places, the Bezdin puts someone, excommunicates someone when they do not have enough respect for the scholars. So, this also not only is it a continuation of Rabbi Shub and Levi, but it also talks about the honor and respect due to a scholar. So it says that we excommunicate someone, we put him in nidoy, and um, uh, because he doesn't, if he doesn't have enough respect for the scholar. The, the, and there's 24 places where this is done. The Bezdin is put someone, excommunicate someone. The Kulon Shanino Bemishna Seno, and all of them are learned in our Mishnah. And our Mishnah does not mean our Mishnah in Brachis. It means in the in the in the set of Mishnah. It's they're all mentioned in the entire set of Mishnah. And um the Kulon Shanino Bemishna Seno in the entire uh uh, like corpus of the Mishnah. Amar le Rabbi Elazar, hecha. So Rabbi Elazar asked Rabbi Shua ben Levi, so where in the Mishnah, we are in the, in the six volumes of the Mishnah, we are, uh, they didn't have Mishnayis then, but we're talking about the, what was, what ended up being printed in the six Mishnayis. They knew it by heart. Um, but the, he said, we, we are in the Mishnah. Is it, you know, which section, where, where would you find these, these 24 places? So Amar le, Lachi Tishka. Go out and find it. Go and search it. Go in and you'll find it. Got to go in and try. I'm not going to, uh, you know, tell you all the details. You got to go and study. Go and 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 and, uh, and you'll find it. So Rabbi, he went. Rabbi, I have a question. Why? Yeah. Do, why does it? Why does the Mishnah use lechi if you're ta- if you're talking to a man? Should be lech tishkach. Go and find. Uh, you know, I don't know if the grammar of of Aramaic is the same as as the grammar of Hebrew. 
And, um, you know, th these are Aramaic words. Ah, okay. Like he doesn't say Eifo, he says Hecha. You know, these are Aramaic words. So, Nafak Dak, he went out and he tried to be Medayak to, you know, study it intensely, uh, to deduce from different, from the statements of the Mishnah uh, to find the laws where one would deserve to be excommunicated. The Ashkach plus, and he found three cases. He found a case where someone would be deserving, should, should go be excommunicated, is if a person is mezalzel, if he um, uh, considers in, uh, unimportant, netilas yodayim, washing the hands, that if a person is mezalzel, like makes fun of the, or sees, uh, uh, treats it with contempt, the, uh, uh, the, the, the obligation that the rabbis established of washing one's hands, that would be one case of, uh, excom deserves excommunication. And here we have the exact example that we had earlier. Person speaks bad about a scholar after they pass away. Deserves to be excommunicated. And a person who is acts a uh, chutzpahdik, like uh, insolent. Ar arrogantly. Arrogantly, okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Reb Shlema Yosef. Uh, he, he speaks uh, uh, arrogantly against Hashem, kalape maila towards Hashem. But I think it, it has an element of chutzpah. I think uh, the magus daitoi, um, Includes includes an element of chutzpah, so we're going to now see these cases. So the Gemara now explains the cases. So one of the cases that we mentioned was a person who speaks negatively after a scholar who passed away. Maihi, where is that Mishnah? Ditnan, because we learned in a Mishnah. Who haya Omer? He used to say. This is referring to Akavya ben Mahalalo, a scholar. His name was Akavya ben Mahalalo. And he used to say, in Mashkin, we do not give the soita water to a Giyores or a freed Canaanite woman slave. What is the laws of the soita water? If a woman is warned by her husband not to be not to hang out with a, another another man so there's a married woman and her husband is concerned that she is uh, going going to have an affair with someone else she's getting friendly with a certain person and it's becoming uh, questionable or they're getting a little intimate the husband warns his wife and he says, do not be secluded with this other man. And that's called kinui. And then witnesses find that they were actually in a secluded area. So we don't know if they sinned, but they were in a locked room together. And we're not sure if they actually sinned or maybe they were just... Um, you know, uh, uh, schmoozing. They were hanging out together, and, you know, enjoying each other's company. We don't know if they sinned. So the husband is not allowed to be with his wife because she might have transgressed. She might have, she might have done adultery. And the law is he takes her to Yerushalayim, to the base Hamikdash, and they get they bring a sacrifice they bring a, a a meal offering a sacrifice a mincha doesn't have oil because it's a sinor it's a it's a it's not muhudr it's not a 
something of uh, of honor. This is a a uh, like a sin type of a situation, a, the, a sad situation. And they bring the sacrifice and they give her water to drink that has Hashem's name and many verses erased in this water. So they they write out a little portion of many verses on parchment. And the, then it's erased inside this water. And the woman drinks the water, and that is called the Saita water. Now, what happens after she drinks this water? After she drinks the water, if she actually sinned and committed adultery, her body will uh, explode. If she did not sin, it actually becomes like a medicine and healing to her body. So if she only had girls before, now she'll have a boy. If she didn't have any kids before, now she'll be able to have children. If she only had girls before, now she'll have a boy. If she only had ugly children, she'll have beautiful children. So, you know, and, and, and basically it'll be like a medicine if she didn't sin. But if she sinned, her body will explode. So the, the law of Saita in the Torah, it mentions Daber el Bnei Yisrael. Speak to the Bnei Yisrael. And the, Rebbe, uh, th this rabbi, Akavia ben Mahalalel, says that since it says, speak to the B'nai Yisrael, and the, 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 uh, a woman who's a giyoras, or which the truth of the matter is, Rashi says, it doesn't mean a woman who's a giyoras. Rashi says it means the wife of a ger. So even if she's not a Giyaris, but she's the wife of a Ger, that's really who we're referring to. Um, and the wife of an Eved, of a slave that's freed. But I have to mention that the Rambam does say a Giyaris. So we have a uh, difference of opinion, it seems like, between Rashi and the Rambam. But we're basically, the verse says, speak to the Bnei Yisrael. And so Kavya ben Mahalal says, this, this law doesn't apply to the wife of a uh, Giyaris or to a Giyaris, a woman who's not exactly from the Bnei Yisrael. She might have become part of the Jewish people, but she's not born into the Bnei Yisrael. And therefore, um, uh, she doesn't have this law of the sight of water. So that was Akavya's opinion. So now let's go back inside the, 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 the Gemara. The Tanan, we learned in a Mishnah, who haya imra kavya used to say ain mashtin layas hagiyres layas mishof whatever we don't give sight of water to a giyres which rashi doesn't learn a giyres it means the wife of a ger but the rambam learns it means literally a giyres and a mishof layas mishof whatever and we don't give the water to to a woman who's a mishof whatever a either a woman who is uh, a freed slave who marries a, a Jewish man or a wife of a, of a slave that was freed. So we don't give them, either of these women, a, the sight of water to drink. But the rabbis argue with Akavya ben Mahalalo. And the rabbis say, yeah, they are also eligible and part of the law of the sight of water. Now, the rabbis wanted to bring a proof. Va'amrulai, and the rabbis told Akavya ben Mahalalel, we have a proof against you. Maise b'charkemis. We have a story of Karkemis, Shivcha Mishochreres b'Yerushalayim. She was a, uh, a, um, a Shivcha, a woman, a female slave that was freed and in Yerushalayim, v'hishkua Shmaya v'avtalyon. In Shmaya and Avtalyon, they gave her to drink um, this water. And so you see that even a, a Shiv HaMeshachreres, who's also considered a, a Giyaris, because she was non-Jew and she became Jewish, and she's, but she's, all, she, you know, she's also called a, a slave that was freed. Uh, she, she is... Uh, we see that you give her to drink because they gave her to drink this water. And these are the, from the previous generation. This was uh, Shmaya and Avtalyon. So what Ooh, did I... Come, 
What? They were convinced themselves. They, well, oh, my, one second. My inner don't, uh, don't, uh, you know, spoil the, the su- suspense over here. So we see that Shmaya and Avtalyon, um, they were the great scholars of the of, of a previous generation, and they gave um, they gave to drink a woman by the name of Charchemus, or she was from a place Charchemus. Rashi has two understandings that it either her name was Charchemus or her place, the place she lived was Charchemus. But you see, you give to drink a Giyaris and a Meshachreras. So the Gemara answers that what did what did Akavya, Akavya answer? The rabbis, he said, Vamar lahem, dugma hishkuha. They said that they didn't, um, they really weren't supposed to give her to drink. They were not supposed to. But because they themselves were converts, Shmaya and Avtalyon, they descended from, um, they descended from um, uh, Sancheirev. They were grandchildren of Sancheirev, who was a king, an evil king, and a uh, uh, guy. And they were descendants of Sancheirev. And, um, and therefore, uh, they, they wanted to give her to drink because they felt, oh, see, we're Jewish. We're, we're really, uh, we're, we're part of all the laws. But basically what he was saying was they were, um, they were wrong what they did and they did it out of uh, a feeling of, uh, of uh, you know, they wanted to include themselves even though they shouldn't have. And therefore, because they had this own issue themselves of being a gayrim, therefore they um, gave her to drink as well, even though it was wrong. So they spoke, so Akavya, that, that's a very um, disrespectful thing to say about Shmaya Vavtalya, to say, oh, they were gayrim themselves and they uh, um, were uh, gonna change the law because they wanted uh, to feel part of the Jewish people, and they wanted her to they they wanted to to to, to feel good themselves and, and feel part of the Jewish people. So that is a negative thing to say that they had a uh, inner um, an inside reason, a hidden reason. A, they were uh, to ch- to you know to do something that was wrong, and. Um, and so he spoke negative about Shmaya Naftali. And the Gemara says, Viniduhu, and the, the rabbis, they put him in Cherem. They put him, ex, they excommunicated him. Umes Viniduyai, and he died in his uh, Nidu, in his Cherem. In other words, he died before. He uh, was was normally a cherem is thirty days, or uh, you, but he died. Be, he died within the cherem, or he didn't ask them to. Normally, you have to re, 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 regret what you did and ask them to be ask them to uh, to uh, allow you back. And uh, he died in the cherem. Vesaklu bezdin as and bezdin stoned his coffin, and it doesn't mean. They stoned his coffin physically. It means they placed a big rock, symbolic of stoning. They placed a, a, a rock on top of his coffin. So that is the story of someone who speaks negative about the Talmud Chacham that passed away. In other words, he, he, he was implying like they didn't have the full authenticity in their sincerity of deciding the law. It wasn't fully sincere and authentic, their decision of law, which is an absolute disrespectful uh, act, to, to, to a statement to say 
these huge, huge, holy and righteous people. And so they put him in Hebrew. So hey, here, I, yes. If if another Chacham is talking bad about the first Chacham that's dead, is he being punished? Saying that the last generation, they were wrong, they're still Chachams, right? No, so and there's this two is things. another Chacham. There, there, there is arguing. You're allowed to argue with other scholars. And then there's being disrespectful. And to say that they, you know, to say that you disagree with, with the opinion of others, that's okay. But to say that, oh, they just did that and they did the wrong thing and they did it only because they had a personal uh, reason for it. And they, you know, and, and that's what they were thinking. And, uh, you know, that is a, that is total disrespect and dis, disrespect for Torah and everything. Uh, you know, uh, saying that they didn't have authority in their decision. That, that's, that's not like just arguing with another. That's not having a, a, a halachic uh, discussion. That is disrespect. That's chutzpah. And, but uh, I, think, I think today's Chacham cannot argue with the decisions of the Chachams that wrote the, the Talmud. Well, obviously, you know, you have to know your place. And uh, we don't, we can't argue, for sure we can't argue. Not we, scholars. but Chachams. Even they. Chachams. They, <laughs> but they also have to realize, you know, where they are. And uh, there's something called Yeridas Hadiris. The generations get lower and lower. Yeah. And, um, and so we are not in the league, uh, and, and in general, to permit something that a previous Bezdin prohibited is also you can only do that if you were greater than them in scholarliness and in number. It's, 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 it's impossible to remove, even though there, you know, there are cases where it would be um, logical to remove some of the laws from, from previous, you know, from previous uh, uh, rules. Uh, th there would be reason to remove some of those laws that maybe aren't as um, applicable now. But, but for example, one of them would be um, the second day of Yom Tov. You know, logically, we have calendars now. We have cell phones. We have WhatsApp. We, have, we can know exactly when the holidays are. And there's absolutely no question. But it's the tradition and it's the rabbinic decrees that we are keeping. And we don't have the ability to remove any of those rabbinic decrees. So we still have it. And uh, I'm sure the, uh, the, 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 the kosher grocery stores really are happy about that. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, we, we have no way of removing uh, the, you know, any of the uh, laws of previous generations. But in any event, in the time of the, um, in, the in the time of the, the Talmud, the Tanoim could argue with each other um, and uh, they could, you know, they, they could have debates. And they, so Akavya could have said that, you know, he could have possibly said that um, Shmaya and Avtalion follow one opinion and I follow maybe a different opinion because uh, he was also a Tana, you know, so he could say, uh, you know, he, he, that he's, he's arguing, but um, he didn't say it that way. He said that they were, you know, he said it in a very disrespectful way. And that's why the Gemara here says that he, um, uh, the Mishnah says, <clears throat> and our Gemara brings it, that, that he was put in Cheru. Now, the Gemara does not conclude with that. We'll soon see that there is another view that he was never put in Cheirim. Akavya was one of the uh, greatest and holiest scholars. He never would have said something like that. So, um, so the, um, the Gemara continues and um, it says, Bahamazalzal ben Atilas Someone who considers it unimportant, he makes fun of the obligation to wash one's hands. Maihi, what is that referring to? The Tanan, because we learned in a Mishnah, 
or in that Mishnah in Idias, and it's in play, it's also somewhere else in, in that it's brought it's brought twice. That Amar Reb Yehuda Chas V'Shalom Sheakavya Ben Mahalalel Nisnade. God forbid to say that a Kavya Ben Mahalalel was put in Chivin. Shein Azara Ninelas Al Kol Adam Yisrael that when they close the the chamber of the Beis Hamikdash during the Paschal offering, there's a term used that when they close that, they would never find anyone that would be in the league of Akavya ben Mahalala that could, that could, you know, that, that could match him, meaning that he was the greatest scholar of his time. The term that's used to show that he was the greatest scholar of his time is that when they, they used to have um, divide the Jewish people into three groups, and they would close the doors of the Beis Hamikdash uh, after each group entered, and they would bring their sacrifices, and they would bring the Paschal offering, and then they would uh, they would the, one group would leave, the next group would come in, and uh, that was on Ere Pesach, the day the the day that. The, the daytime before the Seder, they would bring the carbon Pesach. So it said that, so the term used was that the doors would not close on anyone in the Jewish people that could match Akavya ben Mahalalel in Chachma, in wisdom, in Tahara, in holiness, in purity, and in Yiraschet, fear of sin. So someone on that league, obviously, uh, meaning the only one who was the only one in his, like in that league, um, uh, there's no way to say that the rabbis would have put him in Cherem that he would have done such a sin. God forbid to, to think such a thing. Ella asked me, need to, where, who did they put in Cherem? I can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, where was uh, Kaviyah ben Mahalal El in terms of uh, the his position with respect to uh, Shemaya Naftalion, was he their contemporary? Was he the next generation? What exactly? Uh, that is a good question. I would have to look it up. I, I don't know the, the, the you know, specific uh, Tanoim, which, you know, it, it, you know, it's something you got to, the, 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 there, there are places to look it up, but it's not, the, it's not something automatic that you would know from the Gemara here. You know, you could sometimes you could find it when there, there's discussions between the rabbis of the Talmud or of the Mishnah. So when they have a discussion, then you know, oh, they lived in the same generation. Or it says he said in the name of someone else, he must have learned from that other person. So you have to like figure out uh, which generation he was in. You know, uh, you could figure out either his father, if it says anywhere about Mahalalel, uh, you know, that would be one way or if he ever says something in the name of someone, or if he has a discussion, who are the rabbis that he debates with, you know, and that's how you figure out which generation he's in. But um, uh, it clearly is uh, that he spoke after they passed away. Um, but how many generations uh, difference, uh, that, that's a good question. We could look it up. I'm not sure, do you have a reason why it would make a difference? Well, my question is the following. I mean, if, if Akavia basically was in the same generation as as Shmaya and Avtalion, he may have had first-hand knowledge of this ent entire situation and said what he said. Okay, and it, therefore, to me, it wouldn't be a zilzul of, of uh, Shmaya and Avtalion. Um, well, I think that would be a terrible zilzul because how could you? How could we even think of such a thing that he? In other words. What he's saying is he knows what they had in mind and that they were they had a personal reason why they changed the halacha. Uh, and that is, you know, absolutely uh, uh, unheard of in, in, in Yiddishkeit, that someone would, you know, that a, that a, a, that a scholar would, would, would decide something based on his personal interests and so, not so, because... So let me ask you this, because I'm re I was also reading uh, Rashi. And Rashi, in, the, in explaining uh, Giyot, he says, 
de Bene Israel Amur Bapirasha. So, in other words, it was only talking about Bene Israel. Prat le Eshet Ger, okay, uh, uh, and to the exclusion of the wife of a Ger, uh, uh, and also to uh, a slave who's been freed. So, what they're saying here is that it only uh, applied to uh, Jews, not to those particular cases. So, in fact, the fact that Shmai and Naftalion said, no, it also applies to them as well, would indicate that they, in fact, are reading it differently. Or... That's right. So, in other words, there, there are two ways of learning. Do you say that Bnei Yisrael excludes Gerim or not? And Akavya took a very extreme view, and he said that it excludes Gerim. And the Chachamim argued with him, and they said it doesn't. So Rashi is explaining Akavya's view. The other view is a very obvious view. Rashi doesn't need to explain it, because the entire Torah says, speak to the Bnei Yisrael, and it never excludes uh, Gerim. You know, all the mitzvahs, there's always a Dabr el Bnei Yisrael. So Akavya's view is a very extreme view, and he wants to exclude Gerim from the mitzvah of Saita, from, from the laws of Saita. And, uh, and so Rashi explains his view that it's based on the fact that it says Bnei Yisrael. And, um, and so now the, the question is, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the story that, that, that they bring is the story of this Karkamis who was in the time of Shmaya Naftalyon, and uh, Shmaya Naftalyon gave her to drink. So the question is, if they gave, if they gave her to drink, it, it, you know, you see that they obviously learn the simple meaning that they don't give make that exclusion of Bnei Yisrael, which Akavya was trying to make. And so he, instead of just saying, "Well, you know, maybe I, I you know." Uh, I learn differently or, you know, give another source why he, he feels that, you know, his view is, is more valid or maybe he could find another, you know, another earlier source. Instead, he just, he sort of, um, he says something that's, you know, that's, that's a uh, statement of saying, you know, a, a real chutzpah that dugma um, hishkua, you know, that, that like, they, uh, like they the, did it it's... because what? It's like they they made her drink. No, because, no, not they. It's like he made her drink. They are like her dogma because they're like her hishkua. They gave her to drink because they are like her. They're also gerim. Therefore, hishkua. They gave her to drink. That's a, that's a that's a very embarrassing thing to say. So that's you know. So that that's really uh, the the point here. Okay. So the the next gemara. We, um, mentions that this story of uh, they put Akabya ben Mahalalel in Cherem is not so is, is not the opinion of everyone because Rabbi Yehuda argues he says Chas v'shalom. they did not put him in Cherem Ella es mi nidu es el ben Chanoich rather who did they put in Cherem and now we're about halfway down the page about uh, maybe thirty lines. From the top, thirty lines from the bottom. As me nido, who did they put in Cherem? El Lazar ben Chanoich shepik pek ben Etilas Yodayim. He questioned. He uh, he uh, was skeptical and mezalzel. He was um, um, disregarded the importance of Etilas Yodayim. Uchshemais and when he died, Shalchu Bezdin Bezdin sent v'hinichu Evan Gedola al Aroinai. They placed a large stone on his. Uh, coffin. Lelamedcha to teach you shakol hamesnade. Whoever is in nidoi, who is excommunicated, and who may spin and he died during while he was still excommunicated. Bezdin cyclin as aroina. Bezdin uh, stones his ark, and it doesn't mean they actually his, his coffin. It doesn't mean they actually stone it. it means they 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 place a stone on it symbolic of stone and so that is the uh the the story of um the, uh, that is the i should say the 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 other case another case of um 
uh, of nidoy, of putting, making someone excommunicated because of not honoring the rabbis appropriately of disrespect to the rabbis. So again, we had two cases so far. And we said the third one, but we didn't give the example. But we said the first one is a person who speaks negative about the Talmud Chacham after they pass away. And this one was that he spoke negative about Netilas Yodayim, about disregarded the importance of the rabbis who obligated us to wash our hands. Netilas Yodayim, the obligation of washing one's hands. And um, this is referring to, of course, uh, the washing the hands before they would eat truma, before they would, the kayanim would eat the truma, and our washing of our hands before we, uh, before we eat bread. And this, this uh, Lazar ben Chanoi, he, he was uh, disre disregarded this law and felt it was unimportant. And uh, he, he considered, you know, he, he didn't consider it important. He was mazalzel in the, in the obligation uh, of the rabbis who decreed that our hands need to, that we need to wash our hands. So this is that second case. And, um, and tomorrow, Mitzvah Shem will do the third case. Okay, everyone.